What's up guys, this is Andrew Frezza and Melissa Dixon from Care Coach Lead and today we're going to be dissecting programming and talking specifically about rep ratios and how attuning into this when you're analyzing your programming or building out your programming will allow you to create more balanced programming, more effective programming, more enjoyable programming for sure and allow yourself to just be a better programmer. Okay, so. When I, when I think about balanced programming, when I think about rep ratios, I always think of an example. It was one of my first workouts that I ever did in a CrossFit setting. And it was 21-15-9 of wall walks and box jumps. And that was a terrible workout. I mean, no one should ever program a workout with 45 wall walks, first of all. And I remember that workout just spending so much of the time just laying on my belly with my head kind of tilted to the side like I was about to take a nap because the box jumps were so quick and then it felt like I was spending literally an hour on wall walks. So that's what we're talking about today is these unbalanced workouts where the rep ratios of one thing are extremely challenging and then the rep ratios of another are not challenging at all and they're just kind of there to be there, to take up space, to be filler. And we're gonna use more subtle examples. Hopefully that wall walk example feels like an obvious example to you. If not, you're just probably insanely good at wall walks. Uh, but we're going to use more subtle examples because a lot of times this shows up in subtle ways where on the surface it doesn't really appear that imbalanced, but when you actually dive into it and you start to like think about what it would feel like to do that workout, what it would be like to execute that workout, you realize, oh, that would actually be fairly unbalanced in a workout. Yeah, it, we need like we need the simplicity of having a workout that has that cool ring to it, a 21, 15, nine, or all 15s across the board, all sevens across the board. So when you're pushing really hard, you know what number you're on. Mm. But I think too many people get stuck in that pitfall and they don't think about how they translate to one another or what those movement selections actually are to how it skews the ratio from one thing to another. The difficulty, the movement selection, those things really, really will make that 21, 15, 9 of the wall walk seem like an inordinate amount of one thing and then a really fast other thing. Yeah, so let's go through these examples we have on the board. Let's start with this EMOM here. So 21 minute EMOM, seven rounds of 45 seconds on, 15 seconds off, these three movements. So when you look at it, you wanna start to look at, okay, how would it be to spend 45 seconds on a bike? How would it be to spend 45 seconds in a true hollow hold? How would it be to spend 45 seconds on these dumbbell RDLs at a tempo. And the bike is easy because you can really modulate your pace to that amount of working time to make it something you could repeat for seven rounds. The hollow hold though, that's one that jumps out to me of like, oh my God, I struggle sometimes to hold a really good hollow for 25 to 30 seconds. And I would say I'm on the fitter side of our typical client that's in the gym. So if I struggle, to hold that for 25 to 30 seconds, even when fresh, if I'm really holding myself to a high standard, then how can I expect our athletes on average to be able to do seven rounds of 45 seconds with never more than 15 seconds rest between any movement? That is a lot of a hollow, that's a high expectation. And obviously we can scale it, but have we set our athletes up for failure in that sense? Yeah, seven rounds of that is that big thing that I look at. Like 45 minutes might be totally achievable. 45 seconds. In, 45 <laughs> seconds, yeah, in round one. But round two, after I come back off the second bike and the third bike and I'm breathing so heavy, that's a time where no one's gonna do that unbroken. They're all gonna have to accumulate some amount of time in that 45 seconds. This one is just not one of those types of workouts. It's not a every minute on the minute, we're doing 30 seconds of, or 20 seconds of a hollow hold accumulating time. It's the whole 45 seconds of work. That's pretty unrealistic expectation for the general population. Yeah, and through movement selection, we could keep this format. We could still do a core movement in minute two, but we could just make it more doable for a lot of our athletes. So maybe it's a half hollow hold where you have one foot out at any given time. So it's more like a modified tuck. Maybe it's dead bugs, which would be even probably a little easier than that. Or maybe it's a plank, which I say is probably the most ideal movement for that time domain in that amount of rounds that would probably fit the best in this format. Now let's look at this minute three just to make sure that looks balanced as well. And one of the things that I love about tempos is it can help us dial in these rep ratios that we're trying to dial in. So we know a rep at a 3-0-X-1 tempo should take four to five seconds to complete. 
So we got some easy math in 45 seconds, you're gonna complete 10 to 12 reps at that tempo on those dumbbell RDLs. Seven rounds of that, yeah, that's gonna add up. You're gonna be in the range of, of 70 plus RDLs, but that's doable with the appropriate weight as long as we present it that way to the class. Yeah, without that tempo on this, this can turn from a really, um, a really controlled movement to a max rep scenario and really change the entire stimulus of this entire workout. Mm -hmm. So if people are treating it more like the bike calories and they're going mm -hmm. really hard and they're adding speed to their RDLs, you know, the total volume with the tempo, we're looking around 70 ish reps without that tempo. You could double it. Yeah. <laughs> you might it, be able to double it. Easily. People, you can yeah. overload that person's posterior chain and not, not intend to do that. Yeah. All right, so let's go up here to the top right-hand corner. We have three rounds for time, five rope climbs, seven wall walks, nine box jumps, okay? And we did not put a height on the box, and this is where I wanna show you guys, again, where a nuance can make a big difference. Um, now, first off, let's look at the rope climbs versus the wall walks. I think if I had to pick harder one for me, it's gonna be the wall walks, but I could easily see where, for some of our athletes, they're gonna actually struggle more with the rope than they will the wall walk. And I think both of those movements are gonna take about, let's say two minutes on average, two to three minutes per round for the average person in our gym. That's what we want them to take. And then the nine box jumps, let's say that's just a standard height box. That is probably 30 seconds or less of work. So you have two movements that are individually gonna take about two minutes each. And then if that's again, just a standard height box or maybe even a slightly taller box, you're still talking under a minute for that movement, all right? So it's significantly quicker, less than 50% of what those other exercises are gonna take. Now, let's say we still wanna keep this program, but we make this like almost a max height, something that I think athletes can still do safely. Now, this is obviously a competition style workout. I would not program this in a general mm -hmm. fitness setting, but if it was a competition type workout and that box was now 40 inches or 30 inches for, for females, now we're talking we might have a workout there where they're going to have to every rep treat it like a one rep max and it takes 90 seconds to get through those nine box jumps yeah the biggest thing i would see in that is if we're going to play with a ratio like nine box jumps it's got to be something that you can't do unbroken and nine is a number that every athlete's going to do very quickly cycle through those potentially rebound all of them in all three rounds. It's not a high volume of reps compared to 15 total rope climbs on the day, you know, 21 <laughs> total wall walks. Those are higher volumes for those. And then 9, 18, 27 box jumps. You're looking at a really low volume of box jumps when a lot of times we're going 50 plus reps, you know, of box jumps in any given workout. So the first thing I would think is, yeah, raise that box, make them treat it like singles, make them reset every time. But then you're looking at a four time workout. So you're looking at making that ex exponentially more dangerous when there's already high skill things involved. So for me, a clear fix would to be like a seated box jump, something where they have to sit before they jump and they're training that open hip extension and they're treating it like a different movement altogether almost, instead of just making it more dangerous. Yeah. All right, so let's move down to this 15 minute AMRAP here, 15 cal row, 15 devil's press, and 15 pull-ups. And one of the questions that we can ask for all of these workouts that is gonna help us is what is the limiting factor of this day? And when we say that, what is the, what is the limiting factor to this client putting forth their best performance? So in a 15 minute AMRAP, what we're really saying is what is the limiting factor keeping them from the most amount of rounds plus reps because that's the goal of the day is to accomplish more rounds and reps. And if we look at this workout, it becomes pretty obvious to me that for 90% or more of our athletes, the devil's press is gonna be far and above that limiting factor because of the amount of time it's gonna take. 15 cal row, well under a minute for most, 15 devil's press, press could take several minutes to accomplish, and then 15 pull-ups for most athletes is going to take probably under a minute, especially in those first few rounds. Yeah, I definitely think pull-up volume comes into play because that's very specific to each athlete. So that the scaling options there will 
affect people's round time significantly if they're breaking them up fives, five, five, or if they can do 15 butterfly unbroken all day long. That's a very different workout from athlete to athlete. So you have to consider what your slowest and your fastest athletes are going to do with this workout um, and what your fittest athletes will do versus your scaled athletes. But that devil's press is the one where the loading of it has to be really right for 15 mm -hmm. um, in order to allow people to move through. That's a very large number for such a compound movement. Yeah, this is also a very grip heavy, heavy day. Even though the devil's press is, uh, you know, a lot of that's done in the burpee position with the dumbbells, you're still holding onto an object. So I would say on this day, grip is going to be a limiting factor, devil's press. Uh, just cardio ability to cycle it is going to be the key limiting factors and it probably would look like a much more balanced workout if it was 15 5 and then 15 because now each movement is going to take about a minute to complete every single round if i'm writing this workout for one of my clients one of my one-on-one -on -one clients i'm looking at this movement as 15 burpees and 15 snatches in, in mm -hmm. terms of the overall load of the day. So this, this becomes two things in my mind and looking at it that way just gives you a little bit of a different perspective on what you're actually doing with that athlete and it, the time that it's taking in that. Yeah, and then the last concept I wanna share is just the idea of, of having movements that complement each other versus having movements that maybe interfere or make other movements harder. So. When we're thinking about these rep ratios, it's really important to just understand that some movements are gonna be very complementary. Like I would say this workout, even though it's imbalanced from a rep ratio standpoint, it's balanced in terms of the things we're targeting. You have a very leg cardio heavy movement, you have a very core heavy movement, and then you have a very posterior grip heavy movement. So that's a very, those are all very complementary movements. They work well together even though the rep ratios are off. And in general, in a group class setting, a general fitness setting, I believe we always wanna to steer towards more complementary stuff, not a lot of interference here, and balance rep ratios. That's gonna give people the best experience, that's gonna give them a chance to all get the closest stimulus to each other, right? Because if you program a movement that's so far above the limiter, you're gonna have people that are really good at that movement and people that aren't, and then it doesn't give you a lot of room to, to scale it and keep that stimulus consistent across the board. Yeah, that's what you were kind of leading into with the grip on this and the grip on this. So the pull-up volume might be easy for some athletes, mm -hmm. but then their grip starts failing from a heavier devil's press, and then they're getting themselves into trouble where this shouldn't be so much of a factor. So those things really change the speed at which people are performing things. If you're not thinking about that as a programmer, that really, really adds up. And that's where you could have some people get three rounds and some people get eight rounds, and that's just not the same stimulus across the board. Right. So hopefully this is helpful for you guys. If you have any questions or comments, leave them below, and we'll see you in the next video.